Something beloved? Well, something new and exciting happened in my life. Uh, for the first time in my life, I have a card that is expiring. Um, yeah? Anybody? No? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not usual, but my cards either break or I get that fraud alert and they have to send me a new card. And so this is the first time that I have actually made it to the end of the life of a card. I feel like it's an accomplishment. Um, I appreciate your support. Um, but it has been a time of chaos and confusion, I have to tell you. Um, I, I just wasn't ready for this. I don't know what would have prepared me. I had a lot of time to get ready for this, and it just, it just caught me off guard. Um, because uh, bill collectors, you know, they, they want their payment. And so they started warning me before I realized that this card was about to expire. Hey, your card's about to expire. I'm like, oh, it's so nice of you to say that. I know, I know what your motive is in that, though. Um, so they're regularly warning me, your card is expiring. I'm getting all these emails and stuff. And I'm like, okay. So I call my credit card company. I'm like, hey, um, my card's about to expire. And that's after like an ungodly number of times I have to click, I think this option, and then I think this option. I don't know. But finally, I get someone on the phone. I'm like, hey, uh, my card's about to expire. And they're like, why are you calling us? Because it's about to expire. I'm like, well, don't worry about it. You'll get a new one. Okay. And then, fast forward a little bit of time, I get an email from my credit card company, and they say, hey, activate your card. If you didn't receive your card, give us a call. I've not received a card. I was told that I was okay. I haven't received a card, so I call that number. After a lot more beep, 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 choosing options, I finally get someone on the phone. I'm like, why are you calling? I'm like, because your email said to call you if I didn't get a card. I'm like, but why are you calling us? Because you said to. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> like, we'll send you a card. I'm like, then why did you send me an email that said to call you if I didn't get a card? I don't understand. Like, Ugh! like, why can't you just clearly say what you need? Like, just clearly tell me what to do or what to expect. And that's kind of how I feel if I'm honest about the book of Philemon. Like, why can't you just say what to do or what to expect? I mean, this is the tension in a letter written from Paul to a slave owner to a master of a slave about a slave that Paul is sending back to his master. He's run away and Paul is saying, you need to go back. What? Why? Why would you send a slave back to his master, Paul? Are you, are you supporting this? Does Paul support slavery? And do you know what slavery is? The practice and presence of slavery was commonplace in ancient civilizations. And this goes all the way back. You've got Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, Rome. Like, it's just all over the world. Slavery. One person being totally in charge of another person. Like, how is, how is that okay? I mean, slavery in the ancient civilizations was actually very broad in how it, how it was expressed or practiced. Um, you, you could have sometimes it would be forced and barbaric. Like think of uh, one kingdom conquering another kingdom. And as they come in literally with weapons and brute force, they force the conquered people to become slaves for them. And so that's just awful. It's violent. It's vile and all these things. Uh, but then there's another type of slavery that was actually far more commonplace. And that was voluntary slavery. That for the sake of upward mobility, if you're born in a position where like, I, just, I, can't, I can't acquire land so that I could then acquire wealth by getting a harvest from the land or whatever it is, like you're in debt, all these things, you could actually voluntarily place yourself into the service as a slave of someone who had more wealth. And, and then it was kind of more of a functional relationship, but still there's this oddity that someone has put themselves under someone else to where now they have real control over them. In either form, we should see that slavery is not what God's design is. Even in the, the lesser evil forms, like that's just not God's design. It's not. A chattel slavery made this so much more pronounced and how evil it is. A chattel slavery is what most of us, because of our context, think of when we think of slavery. And chattel slavery, um, this is when slaves are just nothing more than property. They're the property of their owner. And then even their descendants, as they property, as they have children, their children are born into being the property of their owner, of their master. It's just evil and awful. We know it is. It's brutal force and harsh conditions. You remember the stories of what it was like in this very community not that long ago when people largely, chattel slavery being race-based, were oppressed, were completely controlled. Great threat of violence or even death if they were to oppose their master. 
Now, this became prevalent in the 1400s as European powers, they've discovered the Americas and they start the transatlantic slave trade. And so they would come down to Africa and just kidnap millions, millions of Africans and ship them across where a lot of them would die in the harsh conditions of those ships coming across and then they would be sold to people in the colonies across the Americas where they would be forced to work for another man's profit and live in terrible conditions. And that's not all of them, but that is the great majority. That it was just absolutely evil and awful. And by the mid-1800s, millions of Africans had been forcefully captured, brought over, sold into chattel slavery. Like slavery is and was evil. It is not God's design. So why in the world didn't Paul just say, Philemon, slavery is awful. Cut it out. Like don't, don't you wish that he would just say that? Like, what is all this kind of running around? What, what is he doing? Like, there, like, this might make you really uncomfortable if you've not read all the scriptures. There are laws, like considerable numbers of laws in the Old Testament about how to treat your slave. And I read those things and I bristle. I think, is, is God supporting slavery? And the answer is No. And while we don't have time to unpack those laws and that context, just no, no, he is not. He's actually protecting slaves. But still, we get to the New Testament, and Paul, writing this letter, refuses to just say, hey, slavery is evil. Knock it off. It has no place in the church. Like, why doesn't he just explicitly say that? Or some of his other epistles, where he says, slaves, obey your masters. Like, what? How about about masters free your slaves? What what is this? Why is this like it is? And I want you to do a little thought experiment with me. Think of some profoundly evil thing that you know exists in the world right now. Something that is just evil, it's atrocious. You know that it just breaks the heart of God. It breaks your heart. You so wish that you would see the stop of it right now, that it could never happen again. What is it for you? And you know that there are other people in this world who view the very same thing and they support it. They do not think that it's evil. Do you have it in your head, whatever it is? Now imagine, I bring the two of you together in a room and you have your chance here and you look at that other person who does not think that this is evil. In fact, they celebrate it, they practice it regularly, whatever it is. And you look at them in the eyes and you say, that's evil. What do you think they do? Oh, I had no idea. My goodness, I'm gonna stop. I'm going to stop right now. Oh, knock this off. I am so sorry. No. You know, that, that's why there's still all the rage over these things. Because some people are not convinced and just simply saying, that's evil, knock it off, does not work. It's not working for us. And so there has to be a more effective way than just saying, this is evil. And that does not mean that we don't say this is evil. We do stand for what is true. We speak what is true. There is a time for law, but there's also a time for saying, what is going to be effective here? What will actually change and undo this evil? Is there a more effective way of seeing evil come undone? I believe there is, and I think that is what Paul is actually doing the work of in this. So if you will, turn in your copy of scripture to Philemon. We're going to start in chapter one. There's only one chapter, but verse 17 today. (laughs) Yeah, in one chapter, you'd think you'd just say it. Just say it. Come on, Paul. Philemon 1, 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. This is Paul speaking, talking to Philemon, who he's writing this letter to. So if you consider me, Paul, a partner, welcome him as you would me. Welcome Onesimus, your runaway slave, as you would me, Paul. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Oh, oh, mic drop. (laughs) If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. What is Paul doing here? What is Paul's way of seeing the evil of the situation undone? He doesn't just say, hey, slavery is evil, knock it off. No, he does this so much more effectively. Watch what he does. He stands in Onesimus' place. Do you see that? Welcome him as you would me. 
He puts himself in Onesimus' place. He takes ownership of any debt that Onesimus has incurred. Charge that to my account. And this is where a lot of scholars say, um, it may be that he just ran away. Like it was not legal for Onesimus to run away from his master. Or he may have actually stole some things, which is what a lot of people think. Like to make the journey, to get away. We don't know how fully he has wronged Philemon, but Onesimus has wronged Philemon. But Paul says, charge that to my account. And then he reminds Philemon, hey, you are actually justly obliged to me. You owe me even your very self. And thus we learn that while Onesimus is a spiritual son of Paul, it seems Philemon is as well. That Paul has had a significant impact in both of these individuals, Philemon and Onesimus, and their belief in Jesus and their following in the way of Jesus. That Philemon, don't forget you owe me your very self. Charge it to me, but don't you dare forget, you actually owe me your very self. Don't forget where you came from. So what is Paul doing? By putting himself in Onesimus' place, taking ownership of this debt and reminding Philemon that he is obliged? He's following the way of Jesus. And that's the thing for us, beloved. We need to know the teachings of Jesus, but then we need to obey the teachings of Jesus. And Paul is doing exactly that. I hope in your mind right now, you're scrambling. What teaching of Jesus is he doing right now? It's the Good Samaritan, right? Do you see it? This is Luke 10. If you want to turn there with me, this is Paul knowing and obeying the teachings of Christ. This is him embodying the parable of the Good Samaritan. If you go to Luke chapter 10, it'll also be on the screen behind me, but Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Luke records this It says, then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, is there any better question to ask? We make this almost elementary and kind of gloss over it. But look, in this nation, you have an average of 78 years to live. 78 years to live. And then there's eternity. What you do now matters. What you will spend eternity doing matters so much. So what better question to ask God himself than to say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because don't you want eternal life with God? To be with God forever. The one who wipes the tears from our eyes and says death and the former things, pain, they'll have passed away. Like enter into your master's rest. Well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you long for that to be fully satisfied. Like every yearning, fully satisfied in Christ to be with him, to behold the face of God, to live before him forever. Oh, what glory would that be? Like Paul says, this light and momentary affliction is just preparing for us the weight of eternal glory. Like that everything you encounter, that Jess starting cancer, um, chemo tomorrow, like that's light and momentary, Jess. Like there's eternity to come and you would not believe that this little light and momentary is just preparing you for the weight of eternal glory. And whatever you're going through, this hardship, whatever the trial, whatever the difficulty, that this is just in some beautiful redemptive way, God preparing you for the weight of eternal glory. And so teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How could I know that the weight of eternal glory is going to be pressed on me? And this is what Jesus says, Jesus says 26. What is written in the law? He asked him. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Hmm. Like, you've answered well. Yeah, love God with everything you have. And love your neighbor as yourself. All right. Um, Yeah, got that answer right. But here, now trying to trip Jesus up. And exactly, who is my neighbor? Who's, Who's the person I have to love like I love myself? Now think logically. If you love someone as you love yourself, what does that look like? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. 
They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Those beautiful, haunting words spoken to us as to this man. Go and do the same. Paul is embodying this teaching of Jesus. But Jesus is asked, how do I inherit eternal life? Well, what's the law? How do you read it? Oh, love, love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love my neighbor as myself. Yes, do this and you'll live. But who's my neighbor? Well, who do you hate? That's a good starting place. <laughs> Even the one that you believe you are above, you have the moral high ground because you know that they are involved in something evil. The one that you despise is the one that you should love. The one that you should love. The Samaritans and the Jews had a long history at this point. They hated each other. So much racial tension. The Jews saw the Samaritans as half-breeds. They, they have intermarried and, and they've gotten into all this awful warped stuff and the Samaritans view the Jews like, no, you've departed. And they, so there's all this vying for like, who has the real temple? Who has the real scriptures? Who knows the real God? And all stuff. And they just, they had all this animosity. There's this deep hatred for each other that was prevalent. And here you have this man going down from Jerusalem. He's on this road between Jordan and Jerusalem or Jericho and Jerusalem. And as he's walking, these robbers come and they just beat the mess out of him. They've left him half dead. They've robbed him of everything of value. Now here's this man dying on the side of the road. And here comes a priest. It doesn't say which direction the priest is going. So the priest may be coming from his sacred work or he may be going to his sacred work. But either way, he says, that's not my responsibility. And he skirts around him and goes on. And then a Levite, Another one who's supposed to be in the work of God's holy business does the same thing. He's either coming from or going to his sacred work. That's not my responsibility. And he skirts around him. These are Jews. These are brothers of this man who has been beaten and left for dead. You think, wow, that's kind of like one of the pastors of our church and a deacon of our church seeing one of our members like out dying on the side of the road. You're like, man, I was here at 6.30. I was, I'm, you don't want to hug me right now. I'm sweaty. Like, it's a lot of work to pull this gathering off. And I love it, but it's a lot of work. And, and I get to the end of it, and I'm exhausted. And I've got to go to two different meetings to this afternoon. And like, I, I come by, and like, as I'm pulling out, I see you on the side of the road, and you've been beaten and left for dead. I'm like, so glad I did my business today. <laughs> Drive away. Like, what is that? And then one of the deacons follows me up. He's been here working all morning, putting signs up and all this stuff. And, oh, man, so glad I did my good today drives on by. So these two Jews see a fellow Jew and they leave him dying. And then the Samaritan, who that Jew probably would have hated and that Samaritan could have hated him, but that Samaritan stops to help. What is this? Huh. Man, as you view others being part of a terrible evil, whether that's an institution, a practice, a political party, whatever it is for you, can you see them as human beings with souls? Can you see them as people made in the image of God? Can you care about them? We must. And that means we have to have time for others. We have to have time for others. The, the Levite and the priest, they had no time for this. But the Samaritan, he too had something he was set out to do. But he stops, takes the time to bandage the guy up, takes the time to slow down because now he has to walk with this other guy, half dead on his animal, takes him to an end, spends that day with him, and on the next day, then pays for the guy to continue to stay and be cared for. He has time to stop. We have to have time for others. We can't walk by and say, not my responsibility. I've done my due. But we want a quick fix in life. 
When we see a problem, we want the quick, immediate solution. The quick fix is rarely actually a fix, though. You know that? It's very rare that something quick is actually a solution. Uh, Pastor John Mark Comer, he says this. He says, love takes time. Hurry doesn't have it. Love takes time. Hurry doesn't have it. Or if you're a fan of Mumford and Sons, you know the ending of the song, and I will love with urgency, but not with haste. I will love with urgency, but not with haste. It takes time to love our neighbor. Do you have time to give? It starts with seeing each other. It's so easy to kind of divert the eyes, like look away. I want to get all these feels if I keep looking. I just look away, keep going, tunnel vision. But see each other. Now, uh, a little awkward moment here. House rules. Let's establish some house rules. In beloved church, we look at each other. Make eye contact with each other. Let's have the time. When we pass by, even if we're not going to have a full conversation, <clears throat> look at each other. Let's acknowledge each other's presence. Let's see each other. And then you may realize, oh, wow, you're half dead. I need to stop and help you. <laughs> see each other. And it's not always the sad side. It's grieve with each other, but it's also rejoice with each other. The man, how many times could we celebrate every day and rejoice and just be filled with real laughter? Like when the laughter comes from your belly, don't you want that? And how many times do we miss that opportunity because we just didn't slow down and see that I could join you in that laughter. I could join you in that merriment. We see each other. Um, be weird on you, but eye contact actually advocates the autonomic nervous system. Like it does things in your brain and in your body to make eye contact with each other. Um, sometimes it can be a little harmful because like it, it evokes fear or something, but most of the time it's doing something really good and powerful. That you get the sense of I'm seen. And it helps to make a connection and to know that I'm seen. And often, I mean, a pastoral care secret, you know, I don't have many answers. But one of the most powerful things that I can ever do with most of you is to just see you, to just be present with you, to just be incarnationally here with you. And we do that for each other. We actually are called to pastor each other. That doesn't necessarily mean in the, in the official office we say pastor, elder is synonymous, but the verb of pastor each other is, is actually for all of us. And so much of that is just being present. It's seeing each other, to see each other. Uh, there was a study that just captured my imagination that um, they had participants looking at each other, uh, but what they didn't realize is one of them is in a two-way mirror. And so they're not actually seeing the person on the other side, they're looking at their own reflection. So they're looking into their own eyes. But as they do the MRI scanning and everything, they see that the, the physiological effect on the person who is not actually being seen is the same because they believe they're being seen. There's power in just seeing each other. Love takes time, and it takes us seeing each other. See your neighbor. And then love is sacrificial. It has a cost. Be willing to sacrifice. Like the Good Samaritan, as he now uses his own medicine, his own wine, his own wrappings, his own, it might have been his own clothes. We don't know. He binds up this guy's wounds. He's caring for him, giving him medical attention at his own cost. And then he takes him to an inn where he pays for room and board for this guy and says, here's two more days salary worth of money. Denarii is a day salary. It's like, here's what I would make working for two more days. Take care of him. And if he charges anything else, put it on my account. He's willing to sacrifice. He owns the victim's healing at his own cost. And he shows mercy. If we're going to love our neighbor, we have to show mercy. And what is mercy, though? Mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. So you have the capacity to punish, rightly, justly, punish or harm someone, but instead you show compassion or you show forgiveness. And that's not our instinct. It's not instinctive to show mercy, but it is the way of Jesus. And it's beautiful and powerful. That's why Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. There is great power. There is a blessing in demonstrating and expressing mercy. 
Uh, But as Thomas Aquinas, I think, very rightly commented, justice without mercy leads to cruelty. That we, we can get really, really big on the bandwagon of justice. Like, yes, we want things to be made right, but we're a lot more reluctant to climb onto that wagon of mercy. Especially when the people that you need to show mercy to are part of some evil institution that you know is wrong and justly deserves to be undone. And yet the way of Jesus is to show mercy to even our enemy. To show mercy. Because both are necessary and intertwined. Uh, the, the late pastor and theologian, John Stott, it's going to be on screen, but uh, John Stott said it like this. He said, the cross is the ultimate expression of God's justice and mercy. It is justice because sin is condemned. It is mercy because sinners are forgiven. Both are here, gloriously displayed at the cross. There is justice and there is mercy. And as we consider that, that to follow in the way of Jesus is to be people of justice and mercy. It's to be people who slow down and have time and are willing to sacrifice seeing our neighbor, even those that we struggle to love. We love them. And we think back to what Paul is doing here. And I want to ask, do you see the paradigm of Jesus? And both how Jesus and Paul are engaged in this work. As Paul engaged Philemon, and now the Good Samaritan also engaged in the work of ministry. Do you see how they're all connected? The Good Samaritan used his medical supplies and put them in his own care. Placed them on his very own animal. Why? Because he stood in his place. And what did Paul do? He stood in Onesimus' place. Welcome him as you would me. And what did Jesus do on Calvary? He stood in our place, dying the death that we deserve. He stood condemned so we could walk free. That he stood in our place. And then Paul took ownership of any debt that Onesimus had occurred, had incurred. It's charge that to my account. Whatever it is, however he's wronged you, whatever it has cost you, charge it to my account. The Good Samaritan pays for the stay in the end. He promises to reimburse any additional expenses after he's already gone through some of his personal travel possessions. He's willing to own the cost. And this is what Jesus has done for us. That Jesus has taken our debt, a debt we could never repay. As we just sang, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. So praise the Lord that Jesus will take our sin fully on himself so that we could be redeemed, that we could be bought back, and now we could be free. He's done this. This is the gospel. This is the good news that you could never earn your favor with God. But he gives it freely in grace. And at great cost to himself that God would send his own son, Jesus, to live a sinless life and be the final full sacrifice. Holy in every way. And yet he gives us his righteousness as he takes our sin on himself and he dies putting it to death. He has paid the debt. The ransom has been paid. We're free If you just put your trust in him, believe that Jesus died and he rose again. He's conquered sin and death. He holds the keys forevermore. And he says, now follow me into everlasting life. So confess you are a sinner. You are wretched. There is nothing you could do to save yourself, but there's a God who's mighty to save. So salvation belongs to the Lord. And he says, follow me. Just believe, confess your sin, repent, turn from it and turn towards God who can save. See the power of our God, our salvation. Trust in him. Don't rely on yourself because you can never do it. And you know it. The standards that we impose on our friends, we don't even keep ourselves. That's what Paul argues in the first three chapters of Romans. You don't even keep your own standards that you impose on others. How in the world do you think you could measure up to a holy God? But that God loves you in grace and is calling you into everlasting life. So good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Love. And how can I love? Only as a response to the love of God. We love because he first loved us. See the love of God for you. And let it transform you. Put your faith in him and walk in obedience to his commands. Know his teachings and then live in light of them. Because Paul reminded Philemon that he's justly obliged to him. You owe me even your very self. Consider what Jesus has done for you. Respond to his call to die to yourself and to live for him, the one who died for all. We walk in obedience. Follow him. Obey him. 
live in light of and share the message of the gospel to see evil undone. That is what Paul is beautifully arguing throughout this letter. No, he doesn't explicitly say, hey, slavery is evil, knock it off. And as much as I would love for him to do that, he does something so much better. He takes the gospel and he lives in light of it. He follows in the way of Jesus and he proclaims it. And in doing that, in living in such a way and proclaiming it, everyone around hears and sees and says, oh, wow, that is evil. This, this aspect of this evil institution is evil. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not do that. And then this aspect is evil. And so what he's doing is he's systematically undoing the institution by undoing all the evil within it. If you take away the evils of the institution, the institution itself crumbles. And isn't that so brilliant? Isn't that so much more effective than us going on Twitter and raging war? Like, oh, no. Live in light of the gospel. Follow in the way of Jesus. Let the world see that and proclaim this good news and watch as it transforms hearts. And that's where real change comes from. That's where it's going to come from. Live in light of and share the message of the gospel to see evil undone. That's Romans 12, 21, where Paul also wrote, and he said, do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. That's the gospel. Strategically using the power of the gospel to see hearts changed, the evils of an institution coming undone. So once they're removed, there's nothing left. Have freedom. Because the aim is the heart. When you see evil and you rightly stand against it, aim for the heart. And your ammo is love. That's what we fight with. The truth of God, yes. But what is the truth of God? He loves us when we don't deserve it. See the gospel. Do its work. We can do so much just kind of spinning in motion and not going anywhere. because we're trying to do it in our own strength. And the way of Jesus is, die to yourself, lay down your life, and watch how life comes from that. Life for you, life for others. This is why we've got to live in light of and share the message of the gospel. So you live in light of it this week as you think through this. As you live in light of the gospel and follow the paradigm of Jesus, know that justice and mercy matter. Let's be a people that stand for justice and mercy. Let's help those who need help. Let's stand against evil. Let's live in light of the gospel. Think, what are the evils of this day that we could attempt to do in so many different ways, and we do, and yet it's the proclamation of the living in light of the gospel that is how we should be pursuing it, to see it come undone. I want to share some things with you. According to Human Life International, as of May of 2023, there have been over 63 million legal abortions in the United States alone since 1973. Life taken. And God alone has the right to take life. According to rain.org, one out of every six American women has been the victim of an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. And one out of 33 men as well. There are more than six women in this room. And that's so painful. There's more than 33 men in this room. That is so painful to think statistically one out of every six women, one out of every 33 men in their lifetime will have been the victim of rape. It's evil. It's awful. We stand against it. Drug overdose deaths in the United States since 2000 are already nearing one million. As people are enslaved to it. Have you met a drug addict? They can be incredibly hurtful. But when you actually spend time and you realize how hopeless they are, how stuck? How can you have mercy and compassion to help? Our U.S. Department of State currently estimates that there are 27.6 million victims of human trafficking around the world at any given time. I remember when I taught high school, that it blows students' minds to think, yes, we study slavery in the past, and yet to think there are more slaves in the world right now than there ever were in history or we can make things look really nice and hide those things? Are we willing to walk the road and actually see something and stop? And let's do something about it. Let's be a people of justice and mercy. Live in light of the gospel. Put yourself in their place. Have time for that. Own their healing at your own cost. Because this is the way of Jesus. 
And then we share this message. We share the gospel. It is what will change hearts. The word of God coming down and transforming. That is what we must do. We must share this gospel. And so I want to challenge you. Actually give you a real challenge. Here's your homework class. Go talk about your king this week. Go share the gospel. Go talk about the hope we have in Jesus. And here's the thing. If they decline the conversation, they shut you down, they reject you, they're incredibly offensive to you, whatever they do in response to your attempt at making much of your king, it may hurt and it will probably hurt many times. Jesus told us, hey, in this world, you will have tribulation. If they hated me, they're gonna hate you too. It's going to happen. But you know what? I want you to come to me next week. I don't care if we never even get to the sermon, if I'm just in a line of you telling me stories. I want to hear them. And if you tell me that it was awful, it was so embarrassing, you fumbled over your words, whatever it was, I'm going to smile. And with my sweaty self, I'm going to hug you. And I'm going to celebrate that that is beautiful obedience. Because Jesus saves. We don't. We just get to share this message. So this week, can you step into that? This mission that Jesus has given us to spread this gospel to the ends of the earth and it starts right here with your own real neighbors. Talk about Jesus. And, uh, and that probably makes a lot of us really uncomfortable. Um, there, was, there was a time not too long ago when it was really popular, like share Jesus without fear, evangelism explosion, the four spiritual laws, like all these different things. Like we had these, these tracks and stuff and like you'd trick people, like they think they found a hundred dollar bill and you're like, oh, Jesus juke. Like, nope, that's, that's not what I thought it was. Like, I, we have those things that kind of make us cringe. I, I heard one pastor call it cringe evangelism. Like, you, you get that, and then, and then you, I remember um, some years ago, a, a friend of mine had walked away from the faith. And it was one of the last times that we got to hang out. And we're walking through downtown Orlando, and a guy that I knew was standing on a little step, and he had a bullhorn, and was screaming, just screaming mad, telling people, all about how they're going to burn in hell and, and all this stuff. And, and that is, there's truth that hell is real and we should not shy away from speaking of it. And then as we walked away and my friend heard this guy, just watched him for a moment and walked away and said, that's why I can't do this. And as he's processing all of what's going on, he just realized like, the only thing my friend walked away from with that is just that guy. He's not thinking about Jesus at all in this moment. He's only thinking about that guy. And so if you were scared of how to share the faith and like you could, you could go with all these different tools and tricks and strategies and some of them are really good and I would encourage you to explore them. Or you think like, I don't want to be that guy. And I'm not saying that everyone doing street preaching is wrong. I think there's a beautiful way to do it. But the way to do it or any way to share the faith is when you walk away, make it your goal that they're thinking about Jesus and not you. That's what you're doing. And then it's actually really freeing and doesn't feel so terrifying. This isn't about me. This is about you knowing Jesus. So I want to walk away with you thinking about Jesus. Speak naturally of what you love to those you love. And we're called to love everyone. Because God loves us. His salvation is offered to us and is secured through Christ's death and his resurrection. There's everlasting life to come. This is good news. Can you believe it? And will you share it? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would be at work in this church as you already are, but all the more, Spirit, would you conform us to the image of Jesus. Help us to walk in his way, to be people of love, to be people who are willing to slow down, to see people, to have compassion, to act in mercy but also champion justice. Because we thank you that we see at the cross that you are a just God and you're also merciful. And so we will forever worship you and praise you for this great salvation. Would you sink this into our hearts? I love you. I praise you and thank you for this church. In the name of Jesus, amen.